me and Diana, we were both crowned African American king and queen. First time in the school's history, two African Americans won. It's the San Jose State University. San Jose State University. And what people did not realize was it, it made national news. It was great. We also had a big hate crime after, like some white group like wrote this huge article like all oh, their monkeys and all this type of stuff. And it was it really upset me at the time because I was I was a senior. Regardless of what black folks do, someone's gonna be mad, white folks are gonna be mad. Peace, peace, and welcome to another discussion. This is Cook on Monday morning. At Cook on Monday morning, we are building lives and make us excited about Monday morning. We believe that if you can own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you can own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. So as I mentioned in other discussions, these are the final uh, Cook on Monday morning uh, podcast discussions. I'm getting in all the people that I really love and appreciate, trying to make sure I have part of their story captured, their interests captured, their vision captured. Um, this young man is worth capturing for all three reasons and more. This is uh, my cousin. Uh, I would call him little, but he's much bigger than me. <laughs> and I would, I would, I should call him little, but he does it much bigger than me. And, you know, in, the, in his height and in his enterprises. Uh, I remember back in the day when he was homecoming king at San Jose State. <laughs> He's still a king in these streets, doing uh, beautiful things in the community. Just launched a grocery store that I've actually just learned about and I wanted to talk more about. Um, this is this man has a beautiful spirit. Uh, He's has a deeply committed vision for the East Oakland community. And um, I hope you enjoy hearing from him as much as a pleasure it has been for me to get to know him. Daniel Harris Lucas, what's up, beloved? <laughs> How you doing? What's up, big cousin? <laughs> well, here, I guess you are, you are a big cousin, but I'm big. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. That was actually a good intro. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Daniel. See my little cousin, one of them. Um, but no, um, I appreciate the invite. I appreciate sharing our stories, my story, especially what I've been doing. Um, so yeah, my name is Daniel Harris Lucas. Um, I'm one of four owners of, or founding worker owners of the Deep Grocery Co-op. Um, it's, te it's technically an acronym, D-E-E-P. Um, it stands for Deep East Oakland Empowering the People Grocery Co-op. Um, but Basically, the name reflects the area. I live in Deep East Oakland, grew up in Deep East Oakland. So traditionally, it's been the area that I, I felt has been overlooked on the premise of like investment, development, those types of things. Um, so pre-COVID, <laughs> just, just at the beginning of the year, I was a techie. San Francisco, living very comfortably, being a manager, great salary. Um, come March, that all went out the door. COVID start. I, my birthday was March the 8th, March 16th. I no longer had a job, a salary. And it was just like, so what am I going to do? Um, most of my backgrounds in public relations. And when I got into tech, it, it went into food, wellness tech. So it was a different niche in tech, not like Google, Apple. It's like more small, lucrative private companies. Um, and it was eye opening. Oh, let me let me let me interrupt you for a second, because <laughs> because you said a lot. You said a lot that I want to that I want to tease out. Um, so so the you lost you launched the initiative. It was kind of a post pandemic, um, uh, you know, venture that you got into. But, but as as we you know get into that, before we get into that, the last time I saw you, um, you had a lot of it was like a Thanksgiving dinner, and I don't remember if it was last year or the year before that. But um, you had a bunch to say about what was happening in Oakland around like the, the mayor's administration and the condition of the community and like things related to gentrification. You know, so let's 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 talk. Let's talk about East Oakland for a minute. Uh, you said you're, you're you're from there. Like like to talk a little bit about let's start with the pandemic. What's what have you noticed that's different about the community, if anything, since the pandemic started? So one thing I've loved about, like, especially this part of Oakland, um, I've seen since the pandemic, a lot of more mutual aid systems start coming around. Um, um, my organization is a part of the Black Cultural Zone. 
Um, that really started to spin out around the same time that we were growing as an organization while we're going through training. Um, that What's the Black Cultural Zone? So the Black Cultural Zone encompasses like all these different Black-led organizations from like 100 Black Men, my organization, the Deep Grocery Co-op, uh, East Oakland Collective, all these different organizations based in East Oakland. Um, and I, the funny thing is with everything COVID, racial justice, you started to see this shift. So me and my co, like I started in the cohort of seven uh, for cooperative training to learn how to run a co-op, that type of thing. We started that the same weekend as the racial riots, George Floyd riots. So mm. I'm sitting in training. We're all sitting in training. And this is real it's surreal because it's like we in here trying to build up the community. Right, right now, they outside really tearing it down like. I think one of our grocery stores ended up being looted. So there was no grocery store for several weeks after the riots in East Oakland because they tore up the only one we had, which was like, hey, I we get it. You you're mad. We're all rightfully mad. I'm a black man. So I should I want to be out there with you, but from a small business perspective and community perspective, you're doing more damage to yourselves right now than you're actually inflicting on the people you want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so Black Cultural Zone has been really on that aspect of creating space for African Americans in these both uh, deep East Oakland and keeping it that way. Right. And so I think that's really been the spun out thing where it's no longer like, oh, Black people need their space. It's more like, no, nah, we're we're going to take this piece, we're going to create this for ourselves, and we're going to grow from that. And I've seen a lot more organizations and just Black people come together in that aspect of like, we're all trying to do the same thing. So let us come together. Like, my grocery co-op came from three different organ nonprofits working together and wanting to bring the same goal, uh, East Oakland version of West Oakland's worker owned grocery cooperative Mandela grocery. So active non Mandela grocery and repair nations all had the same thought about, well, East Oakland's food access and food security is slightly a little, little off compared to other parts of the city. So where I live, we have food co, which is our, the main grocery store, but I don't shop at Fuco. Fuco opened the year I graduated college. I was going off to school when they came. But before that, there was no grocery store starting at the age of 10 for me. So I didn't grow up grow, grocery shopping in the neighborhood because we didn't have that option. Um, so it wasn't until after the pandemic and losing my job, one night I was driving around and I was just like, I don't want fast food. <laughs> That's the only option I have after six, seven o'clock because the grocery stores are closing down. I was like, how does this work? Like, why why don't we have a grocery store? Or why do we just have this one grocery store compared to the lakes got four or five different grocery stores in a mm-hmm. mile radius? And so then I came about with my project and then the cooperative training, and it was like chewing. I applied. Yeah, I wanna I wanna ask you a little more about the cooperative and, and the riots. Yeah. Because the um because as I was watching the riots, I, I was uh, the, the interesting thing about watching the riots, right? Um, is that it doesn't make sense for to me to burn down our stuff either. And I heard like the, it doesn't make sense to really burn down anything, but it's not really about making sense. Like the, the whole purpose of like rioting is like cathartic release, like, like, you know, burn recklessness. So it's not, it's not like a strategic logical type of like endeavor, you know what I'm saying? It's like rage. Right. But, um, but the role of law enforcement in the riots, like who's supposed to respond? You know, that's kind of like I want. I want to talk to you about that. Um, well, since we're there, I want. I want to talk about that. But I. I want to. I want to come back to this origin story of this collective. You know, the fact that you were doing this. Um, it was. I hadn't. I didn't know about it, but it wasn't surprising to me based on the man that I knew you to be. You know, so I was like, oh, this makes sense that he's doing this. But I didn't know about it till this week. <laughs> so, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about like the role, like like the riot, and then like what what do you think when 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 the community starts to riot, who should respond? It was one of those things where it was like I'm I, I get it, I'm all for it. But then what started to piss me off was in downtown Oakland, black owned businesses were putting in their windows prior to the riots, black owned, do not tear, like we're with it, black lives matter before it got a hype. And one black owned business, several black owned businesses ended up smashed out. And it was like, so time out. <laughs> what are we really doing? Because even then for the riot, 
I live up the street from Foothill Square. So I remember at one point, like 12 o'clock in the morning, I'm like, I wonder if people are really out here looting. Because prior to me going in the house around seven or eight, the police were sitting in the plaza up till some certain point. So when I went back at 12 o'clock in the morning, it was like roaches running in and out of businesses with as much stuff as you can. And I have a shoe palace up here. So it was like, all right, maybe they'll just hit shoe palace and it was Shoe Palace, Rainbow, the Chinese food restaurant, the Metro store. It was just like, there's no, I didn't see the madness of, these are small people of color, <laughs> small business owners already struggling in this global pandemic. And now you're, it, I'm one of the people, if you're going to riot, go after the big chains, national chains, folks who really have insurance, who are going to recoup and still be fine. It's the small businesses already were struggling in Jan March when you, we first shut down and now are already somewhere in the red who now have to figure out how I'm going to repair my store and I don't even, I'm already in a hole. And so mm -hmm. it was like the cops, they could try to respond, but even then I don't think because the, the racial tension is where it is, it's like how much do we expect the cop to do if people are out here Riding on the fact that uh, black men were shot by the police. I know plenty of OPD officers. My my attitude with police is never fuck the police. I grew up with police officers in my life and after school program. So I always had a sense of respect for officers that do the right thing. And I've never held them all under the same umbrella like all police are black. No, but it does get to a question of people in the community. I look at folks in the hood who had looted who are now trying to charge the next brother or sister for the product that they came up on for free. How does that work? If you're going to be about free enterprise and you, you come from, if you're going to rob Robin hood, it shouldn't be charging the next pro, pro brother or sister in the hood. It should be a, here's a discount. Here's this for free. And let's just make this work. Cause that's what it is now. If you, that's why I tell people, if you want to become the producer, understand you can't take on the same attitudes as those before you or the ones you're against because perpetuate the same cycle when i hear people talk about like abolish the police or defund the police right like the 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 only alternative when there's like reckless because reckless looting or whatever is, is is for that business owner that homeowner to protect themselves or protect sure. like their stuff right and they're gonna likely either gonna have a conversation with somebody or you're gonna use force that's kind of like, I don't really know what other options you have. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so like when we say, when people, because I'm not necessarily for or against defunding the police, I understand the message. But then my mm -hmm. question is if you defund the police, who do you call? Because it's not like you have the Black Panthers, Brown Bread. You don't have the community people who were back in the day protecting the community from the police. You're going to disband, like right now, in East Oakland. OPD is not going to respond to most calls here because when we're a high crime area, just this morning, one of my neighbors called about a sideshow happening. Police still haven't showed up. It's like they're not. <laughs> OPD is stretched thin already. Like this is one of the worst cities to be a police officer in because they say you do seven. Your first year is like seven dog years. So it's like you do what you handle a lot. So it's like understanding you have to meet the officers. You understand some of these folks live here, but then there is the there is the fact that we Oakland's around, surrounded by affluent areas where some of these officers live and come from, Pittsburgh, Blackhawk, those types of things. So it's always different. So it's like getting to know. I like I said, I have a sense of respect for OPD because I grew up with them most of my life. So it's like. I understood certain officers not necessarily trying to run into a riot or stopping folks from looting because what are they ultimately going to do in COVID too? Because that's the thing. Even if you arrest somebody, it's not like they finna sit in jail right now. You're getting OR, you're getting out. So I think police's job and that 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 instance of rioting was just control it, make sure nothing gets too extreme because we can't step in. <laughs> yeah. So let's yeah. So let's 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 go back to the, the your venture. So um. You know, I talked about like it me not being surprised that you were taking on something like this. And I know there's um based on our conversations, you've been looking for different ways, involved in different ways to improve the community. And so now you're stepping out as a business owner. It sounds like you got some training through this collective. Um what what talk walk me through like the first days of the operation. Like what what happened? What like the inventory, the location, like so, we're, so right now we're still, so COVID has been, because we started in COVID, it has been a up and down thing for us. 
our ultimate goal is to get in the brick and mortar, but because of the economic, like right now, our realtors told us because of COVID and all these leases, you more than likely will find a building starting starting beginning of the year because people are going to start losing their businesses. Things are going to start foreclosing. So it's like we're probably rolling out with the online store first. That's one thing that says on the website, uh, online store coming soon. And that's more intentional on us trying to find a temporary space that we can do like grocery pickup. People don't necessarily have to come in and shop. You can just order your groceries online. Um, so our early operations, our first like official operation started September 1st. Um, that's when we were done with training. Um, we went from seven individuals to four, um, and the four of us have been in worker owner candidacy since September. Um, and that looked like <laughs> any other thing. Every day we're sitting on business or different business planning calls, development calls, working on business plans, looking at marketing plans, trying to figure out fundraising. Um, how much money do we need to necessarily get into a space? How much space do we need to be fully functional? Um, and it, it, it's been exciting, especially in COVID, because it's like, wow, I had to look the other day. I was like, I've we've accomplished a lot for us to have started June 1st. And now we're at December. We've gone through six weeks or 12 weeks of training um, to learn how to run a cooperative thanks to Mandela Grocery Co-op. But then we also had to get into the actual details of building and uh, like an understanding like we started off having a nonprofit fit financially sponsor us so we had were able to get grants to, so this is how we got initial money to really start our trainings and being able to get where we're at today looking at december we've got an incorporated business license permits um we've actually been out to be able to sell at the black cultural zone black farmers market um, and we're still just continuously rolling things out. Right, we're going to be dropping merchandise soon. And it's just been, our goal has always been how to be intentional with who we're trying to serve. Um, we've done different media outlets or different media articles and things like I've done an interview with CNN, Jake Tapper, <laughs> or MSNBC, Jake Tapper, um, CNN, and those types of things. But we took, we started to look at who we were taking interviews from. Because the thing, one of our first interviews was with Berkeley Side um, Food Art uh, Magazine. And the article was all right, but then it, it, surely, it quickly showed us how the narrative of our co-op could be turned into a racial thing of, oh, this is just a black and brown thing, whites aren't invited. And that it was a it was an eye opening thing, but because of my background in PR, I kind of just read it and went past it, and then explained to our group, we're gonna get how people write our story is gonna cause someone a problem either way it goes. As long as we know who we're trying to serve and what's what our community is saying, that's what we should be focused on. Because I said it's not an only black and brown thing. Our priority has been to focus on a group of people who no one traditionally they overlook. So we're bringing our own business where the four of us are all people of color, black and Latina, to show people, hey, black people in East Oakland, deep East Oakland, blacks and Latinas in deep East Oakland can come together, build a grocery store that's run and owned by the community and give back to our community. Because that's, I think that's the best, the, the beauty in it is that you have grocery stores, but most grocery stores aren't doing food distribution, making sure like, oh, okay, we're in the middle of COVID. We have elders in the community. We have single parents who may be struggling on the premise of like, there is no economic relief. <laughs> EDD is going, the, the Congress is stalling on trying to get something passed. And it's like, right now we have an understanding that it's gonna get real dark probably towards the end of this month into the new year because the administration just, no one in legislation or administration is caring about the people. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's when I think the community has to really step up and really, you have to look out for your hood. Like I remember the old school of like hood folks, that was their priority. Making sure like you not only have money in your pocket and that you look fine, but also that you took care of your community. And I think when you ask who should respond in instances like that, it shouldn't be the police. If you love your hood, you love your community, you should be the one out there protecting them stores. Cause I was telling people like, what's the difference between us going out there with guns or standing in front of a store and the police? It shows a little bit difference. It's not a suit. It's a it's the person who has is gonna be affected about the grocery store being looted and tore down and closed for two and a half weeks. And now we have nothing and we gotta go back to shopping in San Leandro or going out the way. So I think 
it's just people using their sense and being able to step out from me, me, me to think about like us collectively, especially people of color in this time. I think the dynamic has shifted from, oh, well, we've been overlooked. No, <laughs> for far too long, certain things have gone on and now we just don't want it to happen anymore and we're going to change it. Yeah, uh, I'm of that same opinion that, um, you know, because you brought up the Black Panthers earlier uh, as like the, the established force that did the protection and initially that was like protection for or part i should and they're from oakland and right right like you know you from out there we should be we should know how to protect to protect and defend like ourselves our businesses and our families and um and you brought up the interesting thing about you know who we serve and and like this perception or this sensitivity to being casted a certain way that may not align with what you're actually out there to do um, so you're, you're building something, you're building a new enterprise that, uh, has been a longstanding conversation throughout all my time in community work, like food deserts, access to access to, you know, food that's like more nutritious and, and communities that historically deal with like obesity, um, you know, heart disease, diabetes, that they're, they're not being enough food, proper food access, right? So based on all these conversations for how long they've ha been been happening, you know, I've always been like, you know, well, why is it still a problem? Like, how come somebody's just not doing it, you know? And so you are that person, but <laughs> but how long have you been paying attention to this issue generally? Um, so generally, I would say really focused on it was in my like work in tech. Um, I had worked at Good Eggs, and Good Eggs' whole mission is growing and sustaining local food systems, that type of thing. And so it was like, oh, what's a food system? And then it started making me realize, like, I typically, like to this day, I still don't really grocery shop in my neighborhood. I still go out to the next city about five minutes away. So it's like, hmm, what does my food system look like? And then I had to start really looking and examining that, like, I have this one grocery store, which is not even a high-quality grocery store, like Safeway, Wall or Whole Foods, that type of thing. It's a affordable grocery store, and that's what people are saying. East Oakland went from being it's not a food desert because you technically have access. The thing is starting to look at food apartheid, the different reasons of why this part of East Oakland only has one major grocery store, but why does Lake Merritt, which is technically the beginning of East Oakland, have Whole Foods, Trader Joe's? Albertsons, Lucky's, and that's all within the lake, which it's the same. It's still about the same general population, the same over here, but the social economic status is a lot higher. You got a lot more rich folks over by the lake than you do on this side. There's homeowners, working families, single families on this side. So it's like, do they not deserve access to healthy foods? Because my whole thing is on a holistic thing of if people eat better, they see their doctor and they're happy, that's a very healthy person, especially when you think about what food is what can cure you or hurt you. So when you get into the aspect of not having access and all you got is food or fast foods after seven o'clock and you can't go buy some fresh things to go cook this, it gets into, well, why? Because why did Whole Foods, why did Whole Foods and Sprouts choose the group? plant or build the store in right in the vicinity of each other in the near the lake, why not bring something like that out to East Oakland, deep East Oakland? What's the difference if your whole premise is trying to feed people and access that type of thing? But related to the COVID thing too, around grocery stores, grocery stores never closed. They were like considered essential, which was kind of like, you know, I don't know, so much new came out this year. <laughs> um, are you, have you thought at all about how that affects your business? So we have, we think like, so with COVID, we've had to think along the lines, like even us get purchasing a brick and mortar store, even if we did buy a building because of the guidelines, we wouldn't be expecting a lot of people in and out the store. It would probably be an online pickup type of thing because, because of COVID um, or then the fact like we were ready to, we were thinking like, okay, we're about to come up out of the restrictions. We're slowly getting better. And then bam we're shut back down and we're like, well, damn, it's till January 4th. All right, luckily we have the holiday season, so a lot's not happening. If we were an operating business, 
it would be kind of hectic right now because we don't know it's four of us. So we, it's not like we have a whole team of people. How will we operate a running store? How will we fill orders? How will we still get it to the people? That's a little bit more that we're still trying to figure out before we get into the full on scale of here's the grocery store. Here's this, because we are, I'm starting to see, we like seeing through our training, it takes a lot beyond just, oh, being able to sell and all that. You got to stock it. You got to store it. You got to make sure dates and all those types of things are staying on top. So every day is different, but you have certain marks that you have to make every day. And so I think COVID has taught us all adaptability. I mean, coming in, it was an adaptability thing for most of us because I know all of us worked in different industries. So it was like, I think one of the young ladies was uh, on the East Coast teaching and she has a master's in Latina studies and she lost her job. And so she was like, all right, well, what am I going to do next? So then I think all four of us came to the same perspective of, I love my hood and we have the same access to food problem that most of all of us grew up with. Let me do something about it because obviously the city isn't going to do anything. It's not a priority to them. Um, especially like I live in district seven, our council, mem our council, See, just went up for election this past uh, selection. And it went from Larry Reed, who's been there all my life, to his daughter. And it was like, I don't know how much more we can expect from the same household of politics. <laughs> um, but I said, there needs to be, con I think I think people will really lax with Larry Reed on letting DP Stokeland get to where it's at because there's projects that he allowed to happen but I don't think he was looking at everybody. I don't think he cared enough about certain aspects or certain parts of East Oakland to invest and make sure money was driven in there. Because I've told, I told my business partners, there should be no reason why no city council person gets behind what we're doing because they know they haven't done it. And it's community led, community owned. There's no, I shouldn't hear no lip on anybody in city hall of, oh, well, that's not a good idea. Why isn't it? Because you could have right. easily did it. You could have easily, City planning, urban planning, y'all could have for surely thought about getting somebody or attracting a space to a big grocery store. And that's not what you've done. Mm -hmm. I want to put you in touch with um there's a there's a brother that I that I came across that launched uh a grocery store in Baltimore that's like, you know, historically has a lot of the same and and the he communicates about it as food apartheid. And so when you mentioned that, um, and there's a woman who did a film on him. Uh, who I had on a podcast. Her name is Emily Stubbs. She did a film on them called Deserted. That talked about a lot of the issues that are connected to what you're doing, but for Baltimore, for like I think it was I think it's I think it's West Baltimore. Uh, and and one of the reasons that one of the things that I always liked about you too was that um, how well versed you are in local politics and uh, you know all the players and how the agencies work together. I can't even take credit. You know who that's from. That's from my grandma. That's uh -huh. from Ohe. <laughs> like, you know, my grandma uh -huh. all the years of City Hall. So it wasn't until like later on in college that I really started understanding like all the stuff she used to have us out there doing. Mm -hmm. Understanding like, no, we've really met some major players. Like I've got photos with Gavin Newsom when he was running for mayor and so he's like those types of things. So it's like I think taking those experience and having such a very vivacious grandmother, you know my grandma. Like, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what really led into this. So like when you say, I, I can see how you end up in it. Yeah. Once I really started getting into it, I was like, this is all that social worker grandma, like all the mirrors and firing, talking to canvassing for different people. But I think that's where the care for the community really shows up is, you know, she spent 20 something years at Highland Hospital doing domestic violence social work. So it's like, it takes a different type of person. But then it was like, I think that's a big influence on why I care so much in this project means so much is because it's not it's not about the four of us we're not in the grocery game you don't you won't become a millionaire in the grocery game uh -huh. it's really about the aspect of hey this is something that we saw a problem this is the solution that we came up with that we think is best works for our community and mm -hmm. i think that's where a lot of people are starting to get hit and they really there's a lot of support out there for us that we see and it's it's great but I want to make sure I'm getting the support from the people I'm serving because, see, that's that's who it really matters at the end of the day for us. As you talked about raising money, um, do you have some objectives around fundraising goals? Like, what are you trying to raise? Um, so currently, our fundraising goal is we have a fundraiser up for 150,000. Um, that's for equipment, um, helping us move into like a temporary space for a few years to allow us to really get stable, uh, really get into providing uh, food more regularly and just people be able to grocery shop with us. Um, 
So we're, we started that campaign earlier this month. Um, I'll send you a link and that type of stuff. But the goal is to try to just get the equipment set up that we need purchased in a spot that allows us accessibility for people to come pick up groceries. Because once we, that's the, our biggest thing now is we've done the footwork and the foundational work, but now let's get the actual product and the access to the people where they need it. So mm -hmm. we've been spending time like looking at different venue or commercial spots and that type of stuff. Then hopefully by the new year or our campaign runs till March. And then by, within that time, we hopefully raise the funds to move into something because our, we get voted into ownership in March, um, full ownership into March. And so then that's really, the four of us really just have all, we have all responsibility now, but when we become full owners into it, it's just like, yeah, this is, it's already our kid, but now we like fully legal, full custody, just all of us at the end of the day. And it's, it's fun. Yeah. So you, so, so you're trying to hit it. You're trying to get to 150 by March. Yes, um, the goal is 150k by uh, the end of March. Um, and and where are you at now? Um, I want to say we're close to 10,000 so far. Um, I, I have to look at the numbers, but on our our page, it looks about 2,000. But people have been donating through Venmo, PayPal, all types of stuff. And it, I, we have people, uh, different folks doing or like fundraisers for us. We got an email this morning. Um, I can't think of the young Simeon Norstadt. I think they're like a food columnist for the New York Times. They doing a huge fundraiser for us right now where they're selling $200 jars or $200 jars of jam. And they've raised like $36,000 in 24 hours. And it was it was really exciting because it, it was it's like, wow, there are people who are willing to really donate and really support what we're doing. And it's great. And, and that's what it's it's all love and it's all wonderful. Um, but yeah, once we get that 150, then we feel like we can get the spot. We can get the spot, ran it out for a few years, just to get us into the, the aspect of this is where we're at. This is come 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 to the deep. Come to your do your grocery right. shop. Um, yeah, well, sign sign me up to do a fundraiser. I want to do a fundraiser for you. Oh, for sure. And, that, and you know, and all the political fundraisers that people did for me, like I I I I raised money a bunch throughout my career, and. Um, and I'm I'm excited to go into a phase of my career where I don't have to ask for money, but this is like I, I want to raise money for you. I definitely want to do that. So sign me up, put me on the calendar. We'll work that out after the discussion. That's that's dope. All right, um, for sure. We got you. Yeah. We got a pitch deck created for pitch meeting to start next, start in January. So I got you in one. I'll put you in for one. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things um, about East Oakland, I was. Uh, you know, I'm winding down my time on a school board. And as I've been doing that, I've been like really trying to wrestle with like, why would I stay in San Francisco? Right. Like um, there's so many other places that have these thriving black communities or longstanding black communities. And I really ne never got to experience that uh, as an adult. And I've been thinking about home ownership. So I've been looking at different places to own, you know, the, the market for single family homes is still like, there's still like people are buying stuff quickly, but the condos, they, they aren't moving. Like nobody's buying condos. And, you know, so East Oakland is kind of in my price range. Right. So I was out there a few weeks ago looking at um, a single family home and, uh, and it was near seminary. That's the hood. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it was like, it was like four or five blocks from seminary and the agent was telling me, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's like, it's kind of like block by block here. Like is it, some blocks are dicier than others. Um, what have you n witnessed around like what's happening with real estate in, in East Oakland? So it's funny you say that. Um, so I had the privilege of still living in the house I grew up with, with my grandmother. So my, I'll use my block for instance. When I grew up, there was a, my best friend's family lived four houses down from me. My other best friend lived right across the street. And then my other friend. So my block since coming back home from school and all that has drastically changed. Every About every year we get a new neighbor. Um, and it's been very interesting because the way gentrification works in the East, you have to buy out everybody. It's not like we have a lot of affordable housing where you can tear down the project and then, oh, you displace them. Right? No, 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 no. You... My grandmother was just telling, like, right? She was like, oh, my property value is up at six. But just like last year, it was like 450, like 475. And I was like, you, <laughs> I was like, you understand, like, that? that's a good indicator, but it also indi indicates that 
it's changed. The neighborhood's changing. And even though we still live in somewhat of the hood, new my neighbors have drastically changed. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I have a neighbor who is white, love it or deaf. She's very supportive of the co-op, but I don't think they necessarily understood where they moved the first year they, <laughs> they moved in. And there was like, I'm really nervous. It's just a sketchy area. No, you just happen to live right off of MacArthur, which is a very busy street. And this particular section still happens to have a little activity. So don't necessarily be nervous, but it was one of those laughing things where I've had this conversation a few times with new neighbors. Like you live on a quiet block, but you are right next to a very, you're between Bancroft and MacArthur. These are busy streets with high activity. So it was like, oh, thanks for that. I don't think people, new people who move in the neighborhoods necessarily are looking at the surrounding area initially. I think they move in and then they get shell shocked like, oh yeah, um, this is not, it's, it's, it's being gentrified, it's not gentrified. Like you're probably one of the first people to roll in here. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a thing that I paid attention to as my neighbors move in and move out. Um, like, all right, who's moving in next? This is a person of color or, oh man, it's another, it's another white person. It's like, so, and then like the history of my block is when my grandmother bought her house about 40, 45 years ago. She bought it from a white person who was moving out to the suburbs and white flight. So she was like, most of the area over here was white because it's not where I live is it encompasses that starts the hills and goes up to the hills. So I live like towards the slope. So we have different social economic status in my one zip code. You have the hills, then you have the flats, and then you have by the water. So it's like you have different people all surrounded in this one little area. And I think there, I think gentrifiers haven't yes necessarily understood. Like I'm four blocks from the real hood hood. They still shoot actively and those types of things. So it's still like don't let that be. Don't fall into it. And I tell my neighbors all the time: if you're in that life, it's gonna find you live your every day and just keep vigilant at times, but you should be fine. And I think people are starting to understand that as neighborhoods change. Yeah, you're talking about it like by, as a house by house kind of general change progression. And, and you're talking about like the dynamics of the, like what these blacks mean and how, and how the, and how they sort of like the type of activity that's there. One of the, one of the things that I think is still really common that I wanted you to address is like home invasions. Um, I, I, it's funny because I have citizen app. <laughs> okay. So I want to say before the pandemic, you would get the occasional alert about shooting or home robberies or types of, those types of things. Now, as the pandemic has progressed and you can see the financial stress of people, you do start hearing about home invasions. You're starting to hear more robberies. I feel like more violent crime is starting to become more prevalent in Oakland, which is like, I think this year we hit 100 murders. That hasn't happened in a very long time since I, I'm 30 almost. So I remember walk, waking up, watching the news on high crime, home robberies, some of those types of things. And it's like, are we back in 08? Like 07, 05? Because it's like, this is when... I'm all, now we have technology, so now you're being alerted. What used to be a blind thing of like, oh, you may hear it on the news. It's like, nah, in real time, you you got the alert that this person's been robbed or is a home invasion. And it's like, all right, so how how does this work? Because if this is going to be this, it, it, at one point I started to really start questioning like, hmm, with all this crime going on, like I personally don't carry a gun, but I know most people who live in the hood do, and it's like, well, with everything that's starting to go on, maybe I should go own something in case because it's looking like someone's getting broken into or getting robbed on the daily in East Oakland. And it's like, police are not ma- like the police are not making these high crimes unless it's very violent, those types of things. So it's like, you may not, you may call 911 and it's not a guarantee that they're going to show up or your home's been robbed and they show up 10 hours later because they have other high priority. It's like, man, like, and I, I love I, I love East Oakland and it's great, but it's like at certain times you'd be like, damn, I'm sick of this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the that's still the big question mark, you know, because no, that's not maybe it's not a big like what to do. Because um we just talked about protecting your yourself, your house, your family, your community. And you know, it's either a conversation or you're using force, right? right? And so I know with the police, they respond to they're most likely to respond to like a crime in progress. Like, you know, if it's like a violent crime in progress and if it's 
something that happened and it's no longer in progress, like it's not going to really get. And then what they what what will they actually do when they arrive, right? Like the, you know they can pursue the person, and, or even if you know it's about to happen, they can't do nothing until it's actually happening. So like the the perception of what they can actually resolve is like kind of limited and you know um it'd be interesting when you call them because you'd be like so what can you actually handle because uh-huh. it's like you can call them and you're like oh well we'll send somebody out well when will you send somebody out because right. see my triage is that this is high level to y'all it's like oh no we have other stuff i'm like but I, for instance i call opd about folks squatting in the building that has now become a drug house that type of thing my neighbors have called and it took them six months to finally come out to like clear them out but they didn't necessarily do it in an effective manner where they was back in there two days later and they're back there now so it was really like one of the things me and my neighbors had a conversation like how effective is it for us to call them versus us going up there and just handling on some like this is my neighborhood you got to cut like Cause I was like, it's starting to get to the point where neighborhoods is over like, all right, we're well, fine. I'm not going to call the police. We'll handle it ourselves. And people have that option. That's why I'm like, I just don't like, if we start that, that route, it's no telling what's going to happen. Everybody doesn't have the same sense around what, how they interact and handle conflict, especially when you got folks with guns, like everyone has a weapon now, especially when California is like their, their walls are getting more stringent, but it's like everyone still has a gun. So I don't know how well, don't know how well your laws are working. If I know kids with guns running around here, what, how, how did they get the gun? Y'all ain't still trying to figure that one out because I, I have the same question. Like, yeah, they didn't make it in East Oakland. That's for sure. Yeah, and how did you get way to East? Oakland? Oh, oh, okay. Well, like, it just. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of excuses from people when it'd be like, if you have certain laws and things in place certain things should not happen if you enforce them correctly but i guess we don't enforce them we just it's all on paper Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like um i mean being in politics and seeing some of this stuff happen it's like the perception of action is what people rely on being on the ground you know like being i should say being being um mentally ready and then actually train to engage somebody where it can it can escalate you know that's like that is not that is a dangerous situation you know and so you're you're supposed to be you're paying your taxes you're supposed to be relying on these institutions to do the stuff on your behalf and then it's not happening and so like you know what do you do most people move to places where that's not a problem <laughs> if they, they're like all right you know what like yeah, we came from here, but you know, it's not worth it. So that's an option. You can leave. Um, you can deal with the thing and then deal with the consequences. Like someone is like on drugs, if they are on drugs in the moment, like their their their, their judgment, their decision making isn't like you know what it should be. <laughs> like the, they're at a self destructive point to where like they may not even mind dying. So you can engage in a fight with that person. And they're ready to die. You want your life. You got to be ready. Like, just like you're getting trained to launch this business, there needs to be some type of community training that gives people some type of tangible option. But you know what, though? This is kind of like, this is on the flip side of this. (laughs) This is kind of like how, this is how Amal Arbery happened. Not in the same sense. Or Trayvon Martin. This is how Trayvon happened. And, And those men weren't threats. They weren't shooting up in a house next door for six months, you know? And, but then, but white folk, they bout it. Like they gonna go chase you with a pistol, with a firearm and end your life based on perception. And if no authorities were called, you know what I'm saying? It's like, people are engaging with how they protect it. I know you like, you want to jump in. I know you want to say something, <laughs> but people are like, like what we are hesitating about like they're like white folk, like move it. Yeah, you know I'm saying <laughs> it's it's funny you say that because I was telling people like at some point I was driving past a gun store in the middle of the pandemic. I was it's a long ass line. I said, hmm, I wonder how many white people are buying bullets and guns instead of toilet paper and stuff because see their instincts are completely different. Of I got to protect mine, I'm going to do that first, mm-hmm. and the ours is going to be reacted. And he was like, I was telling people like. As the election gets closer, be careful about crazy ass white folks and weapons because 
that's what they've been buying all pandemic. And is they ready to start a race war, civil war, and they bought it. And that's why I was like, who's protecting the community? If if all the thugs got the guns and then they come up in here, are y'all going to be the first ones out on front line shooting? Because you care about your hood. That's not the case. It's the people like me who don't own the guns just standing out there like, so what y'all, what y'all about to do? And then it's like, oh, oh, I'm I'm me, no weapon. So it's like, if you love your hood, show it. And it should be more in the aspect of not just getting money, but just making sure all around they're taking care of their fed. But also if it comes in, you can protect your community in the aspect of that's what that's what I'm that's the whole point of it. Like that's what people forgot. Like Crips and Bloods, gangs started to protect their communities. <laughs> it wasn't on the hype of, oh, let's get money, drugs, and all this other stuff. It's they're neighborhood led organizations to protect, like those types of things. Let's let's talk a little bit more about your story because I talked about you um, being prom king. Were you also student body president or no? I was prom king, student body president, <laughs> student class president, and then ended it off with like homecoming king in college. That was like the triple crown. Homecoming king. Homecoming king. Triple. I'm saying prom, but it's homecoming. <laughs> I mean, that was all of it. You know, I get my brother in script. So the funny thing about it is, um, what people don't know is, I, I was, me and Diana, we were both crowned African-American king and queen. First time in school's history, two African-Americans won. What That's no a, one, it's the San Jose State University. San Jose State University. And the school is like 185 year history at this time. But what people did not realize was it, it made national news. It was great. We also had a big hate crime after, like, my photo and all that was pub- published online and this white, some white group like wrote this huge article like all oh, their monkeys and all this type of stuff. And it was, it really upset me at the time because I was, I was a senior. So I'm in PR, I've just read this article and I, my whole department even was like behind me like, what, what do you want us to do? Like, how can we help you out? And it was like, I mean, it, it didn't, it didn't deafen the, like the accomplishment at any point, but it made me look like, Regardless of what black folks do, someone's going to be mad. White folks are going to be mad. I didn't write the article about me winning. That was, that was someone else. So it was like, uh, they took a lot. They took brace and made that the biggest part of the winning versus it being like, you had to do a lot to be homecoming king. I went through interviews, all those types of things and really showed them why. It was like, all right. It was, but it was, at the end, being able to say I'm the last official homecoming king of the school because the year after me, they dropped titles officially to be gender inclusive. So it was like, ah, you can't take history away from me at the end of the day. I got my photos and names on things. So it was it was fun. And it was actually like one of the highlights of college, especially at San Jose State for me. So they, you said they dropped it afterward to be gender inclusive. Yeah, um, the... Uh, it was it was one of those things where I guess they felt like the LGBT students weren't applying um, for homecoming court because they felt like the titles were gender specific of king and queen. So they dropped them to be more open to allow the participant who won if they wanted to be referred to as king, court, or just royalty. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess it's a, it was one of those shifts that I still slowly started to see right after I won, like, all right, inclusivity, Especially at San Jose State, that was a big thing because my senior year, we also had that racial issue with the freshman having a bicycle lock around his neck and his roommates referring to him as three-fifths of a human. So I think San Jose was trying its best to try to figure out we have a lot going on and we're not necessarily the most inclusive institution because even this is right after me winning <laughs> homecoming, us being the first two black African-Americans winning homecoming king and queen. Then you got the racial incident. Then you have all this other stuff. And I think the school really tried to shift its mindset and tried to really bring this thing about diversity. Um, and it was really confusing for me being a senior I'm in journalism, I'm in public relations in the journalism department. 90% of my profession is white women. So all my classes were mostly white girls. So it was like my senior capstone class, the first day were like, oh, well, we're gonna, we're gonna do something different. The school is implementing a diversity uh, requirement where you guys, we're gonna pick your groups and who you guys work with. This is our capstone class in PR. <laughs> like we didn't spend the last two and a half years with all these people and we know who we like, who we work well with. It was the biggest issue. Like, and 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 I remember our first day of class, it was divided. The students of color sat on one side and the white kid, white girls and white kids sat on the other, and it was up. Like, 
well, why don't you want to work with them? Look, and I remember telling them, at this point, it's no offense on the whole diversity thing, but you can't force us to work with each other when we spent the last two years in the classes dealing with each other and understanding how each of us work. And it was like, my professor got real exasperated with me because I was pushing it hard because the semester before me entering my senior year, I had a white girl tell me in my final project that she was taking my part that I had completed two days before the final was due. And then I ended up being the bad guy because she went to the professor crying that I I emailed her very um, aggressive when she had typed the email in all caps to me. And I was like, I'm, I'm confused, player. Like, <laughs> Um, I thought caps meant she was yelling at me. I just typed the regular email. And then mm-hmm. it became this whole thing of I got drugged into the professor's office about this email. And then I had a black department chair at the time, and which was very like, you don't get too many of those. And I remember him going to bat and I remember sitting in his office like, bro, my mom just passed. I got this, this project. And this is, I feel like I'm being treated some type of way because this white girl is saying the black guy yelled at her an email. Right. And it was like, we had to sit down and was like, oh, that's such a misunderstanding. Yeah, it really was. And it, it was one of those things like the students of color have worked really hard. Like me, myself, grew up in foster care. No one paid for my education but me. So by this time, I'm at the end of the line. I'm not going to let no white girl stand in between me and finishing my degree. But it was an eye-opening moment for my professor and the department. Like in the real world, me and her probably would never interact with each other. She's mm-hmm. from Los Gatos. I'm from Oakland. We don't even live near our 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 social economics is, our statuses are completely different. And it was like, how do? And then that's when I saw the push: diversity, diversity, diversity. And it was just right. like, I'm not fuck diversity. Like, bro, I like with the school of Silicon Valley. <laughs> they not even there's a token black at Facebook, a token black at Google. Like, they don't even got diversity together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said a lot there too. I actually just started doing um. Di- diversity trainings for companies, and one of the reasons why um, I had a lot of a lot of reservations about going into the space, people had constantly been asking me to do more or to help their companies do it, and um, and there is just like this, uh, it's, it's 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 very difficult to kind of navigate and walk through, and but but when you were saying the last, you actually reminded me of uh, Mary Baraka. And I don't know how much you know about him, but um, he wrote he wrote this poem. Amir Baraka is, a, is the father of Ross Baraka. Ross Baraka is currently the mayor of Newark. Um, and Ross Baraka also, he was the teacher that did the skits in Lauren Hill's Miseducation, Miseducation of Lauren Hill. And But Amiri was like a very prominent author during the 60s and 70s he wrote this definitive history on jazz he wrote a lot of sci-fi he's kind of one of the originators of the black futures movement there's like the whole like black future thing or whatever but the day after 9 11 um amir baraka wrote this poem blaming the attacks on bush saying it was inside job and he was the poet laureate of new jersey and because of the controversy of the poem, they they wanted to strip him of the uh, title of poet laureate, and he refused to l- let it go because um, it was a lifetime appointment. And so instead of letting it go, uh, the 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 state of New Jersey ended the classification. So he started he started signing all of his works, the last poet laureate of New Jersey. <laughs> so you just you know well, the, you, the last you know, homecoming king of <laughs> so it's funny because like a, so everyone that wins you usually like you you try to have like a moment like hey whoa, whoa. but the guy so one of my close friends won the year after me he was like oh i'm at homecoming can't say that not p that is the size of me you your homecoming royalty if you want right, to right, 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 right. You're like, how, you, how you gonna say that man that's what it is i mean they dropped uh-huh. they dropped the titles after my year so uh-huh. yeah i'm the last one it's like uh-huh. last king of scotland yep <laughs> right right so something to consider the last homecoming king of san jose state all right, so you 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 kind of you kind of touched a little bit about about um growing up in foster care. Uh, I know you're not an only child. Like, talk a little bit about your brothers and um, 
a little a little, a little bit more about like how you grew up. Oh uh, man, so I am one of five in total. Um, I have Dell, who's the oldest, Lamar, my twin brother Tay, and then Dwayne, and then I have a baby brother who is. 20 about to be 20 um so there's five boys no girls Mm -hmm. um unfortunately my mom so luckily my mom is taking care of me and my brothers up till the age of seven um and so then that's when we were moved up to santa cruz and then we came when we were taken into foster care we were actually wards of santa cruz county but moved to oakland to my other my paternal grandfather um or my fraternal grandmother's house um and she raised me and my brother. So between my grandmother, uh, Ann Smith and Zarana James, it would be, it was like them co-parenting more or less because my granny here in Oakland had us most of the time, but we would spend weekends in the city. So my grandma worked in Oakland in the city, but she would come pick us up on Fridays and we would be over there for the weekend. Um, it was interesting because I mean, what people didn't know before we got to my grandmother, my brothers and I were split. So me, me, Tay, and Dwayne are all, Tay and I are twins, and then Dwayne's 16 months younger than us. We were all together. So Dell and Lamar are like 12 to 15 years older than us. Um, mm-hmm. So when we were in the foster care, it was uh, slightly crazy. Tay got separated to one house, and me and Dwayne were in another. And so it was kind of confusing because we necessarily didn't know what was going on. Um, we just came from school one day and then there was CPS, but we didn't ever, we knew our mom was under a lot of stress and we knew certain things, but it's not like she did drugs in front of us. So it was never like we knew what was going on. Um, but then it was later down as we got older, we started to understand my mom has mental health issues and that, that was pretty a large contributor to her not being able to take care of us and then falling into drug dependency. So my dad was really never in the picture. So my grandmothers really raised me and my brothers all the way up from seven till we emancipated at 18. And then, I mean, it was great having two different types of grandparents. One was a worker, longshoreman supervisor for the Port of Oakland. And then she retired to take care of us. And then I had my grandmother in the city, domestic violence, forensic social worker at Highland Hospital. So it was like, I got a corporate grant. I got like a big muckety muck social worker grandma. Then I got the one who's out here working in the streets and really helping and like showing us. And she was like one of the first black women longshore shoremen for Oakland. So it was like, okay. And then, you know, my, my grandmother, Zerna James, worked for mayors and was all in San Francisco politics for a very long time until she transitioned out to Highland. Um, I mean, foster care was different, but I think my experience in foster care was completely different being the fact that I had my grandparents ra- like raising us. Um, and people were like, oh, it must have been rough. Nah, I felt like an ordinary kid for the most part because it was like, I'm not being moved from placement to placement. I'm not well out the way. I'm living with family. I got my brother. Well, me and my brothers are all in one house. So it was like, I'll never have something. I don't think I really realized I was a foster kid until it started getting around the time to college. And then it's like, Oh, well, you need this paperwork. Oh, well, because you're a foster kid, you're under this status and that type of stuff. So it was like, oh, my grandmother and them never treated us like, oh, y'all foster kids. No, we're your grandkids. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And I had a social worker who would come down occasionally, but it was never, oh, you're bad. You're you're one of those foster kids. It was like, no, nah, he's a regular kid. Like, just live with his grandma. And I think in Oakland, that's the case. A lot, I had a lot of friends who were in foster care that I didn't realize until I got older. Like, no, my grandma raised me. Oh, okay. Like, you... I was in foster care. Oh, so it's like you know, a lot of my friends, that's our camaraderie. We grew up in foster care. We were in classes together. So it was like, all right. And I think being a foster kid actually prepared me for a lot more. <laughs> like I used to tell people like, mm. all right, like y'all never been through anything or that type of thing. Like, and it was like, what do you mean? Like, where you go through foster care and not having parents raise you, it, it changes you and your perspective on those types of things. Like I'm an old soul, but I have old folks raising me and I have a little bit more sense because I don't, I didn't have leeway to do like, I didn't have parents who were several years older than me. I had great grandparents, 40 something, 50 years, old school, those types of things. Like people this day, I have a, one of my girlfriends absolutely hates that I clean on Saturday morning. Why did you do that? Who taught you that? So what my grandma used to do every Saturday, get up early, mm-hmm. clean up, go out. You could be out the house by 12. Duh. Mm-hmm. Like, it was like, it was like, it's appreciative. It showed me a lot. And it, I mean, it only made me get to where I'm at this point. Cause I feel like 
they really instilled education. I mean, like my grandma Dorena has two master's degrees. And for the longest time, I used to hear the story of how she graduated from UC Berkeley and SF State a week apart with her master's degrees. And I never understood until I got into a master's program. It was like, the hell were you working for the mayor doing two master's program, which was illegal at the time and raising my mom and all of that. And it was like, well, damn, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. my grandma really was a super, like in my eyes, a superhero to do all of that. Cause it's like, you have your MPH, you have your MSW and they're a week apart from each other from two different institutions, UC mm-hmm. Berkeley and SF State. That, mm-hmm. and I was like, I applied you black woman when I started. Right, 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 right. Like, yeah, that's not, yeah. I wasn't an easy feat, I'm sure. Our, our black women, our grandmothers are, our superheroes, you know, yeah. it's like it's it's a trip because um. So uh, hold on, so are you currently in school or no? Oh uh, no, um, I paused. Um, I had started at UMD Law School, um, and then uh, I've been out for what? I stopped right before my father died. He got sick, and so it was kind of hard to manage all of that. So I took a pause on my law degree, but I'm actually looking at going back to finish. Um, hopefully next start next year. Okay. Um, but yeah, I got to finish. That, I think that's been my personal goal just because my grandmother is like, you finish your master's, get your JD, and then you're done. Because if she can get two master's degree, I can at least get a JD, and I, I know I'm good. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about culture, and then I want to uh, go on to our rapid fire and let you get back to your evening. <laughs> you know, I, I know that you, uh, I know I, I know you enjoy music. Um, I know you. <laughs> I know you have a lot of great opinions, <laughs> um, and you know let's 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 start let's start with Bay Area and then kind of go a little national. You know, um, do you listen to Gucci? Very rarely. I mean, okay. he's got some music, but I'll be. I'm. I'm not gonna lie. A lot of Southern rappers don't get a lot of my time on the premise. Like I, I live in the Bay Area, so y'all. Oh, so you big on you big you big on Bay rappers. Well, Bay rappers, but like I'll listen to folks from like New Orleans, Louisiana, those type of things. But it's like Alabama, Mississippi rappers. No, I don't listen to most of them, like a lot of y'all. Uh, but Atlanta. yeah, I'll listen to a few folks. Like Outkast is my biggest Atlanta group. Like always mm-hmm. for T Tip. I mean those type of things. But it's like oh, I'm not listening to most of y'all from the south. Mm-hmm. So so who from the Bay? Oh, who not? I mean, there's Neff the Pharaoh, uh, Capolo 304. Capolo 304 is actually a close friend of my twin brother and I, so I see him a lot. Um, like Kamaya. Kamaya is from my hood. So it's like I've seen her multiple times, music videos shot right up the street at a local liquor store. Um, but then there's like a lot of Guap Dad and all those type of folks out the bear. Ain't Sweetie from out here? She's from Sacramento. I mean, people be like, "Oh, uh, we're, like, we cut line off at the Bay." At what point? But I mean, guess she's from the Bay. If you can, because <laughs> um, I, I, mean, I just heard this song today that encompassed like all the zip codes from here to Sac, and it was just like, "Oh, it's all Oaklandish." And I was like, <laughs> "I don't." Know. <laughs> well, what about uh, oh, is Daly City the other side of the water? That is not Oakland. Like, what about um uh the homie uh uh. Oh, Larry Jones. He can really rap. Uh, he's from Sac too, though. Mozzie? Yes, Mozzie. <laughs> Listen to a little Mozzie, you know. I, 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 like, about, I like I like storytellers. What about Filthy Rich? No. So <laughs> Filthy uh, <laughs> Rich. What about G Easy? <laughs> no, I mean G Easy. <laughs> but he'll catch me. Like I like his I like the song he did with Juvenile, but it's not like I get confused because it's like, oh, when you say you're from the Bay Area, like I want to know you from the Bay Area. Like, where'd you go to school? Like that's uh-huh. like, and it was like, geez, and I was like, what's this white boy come from? Like, <laughs> what school you go to? Oh, he went to school of the arts, bro. That is not an Oakland school. It's not like skyline. You question his credentials. <laughs> I mean, like, okay, for instance, like when. Keisha Kamaya pressed Kaylani about being from Oakland, and it was like, "What's your address?" Everyone know Keisha Cole from the '80s. Everyone know Kamaya from. Ooh, ooh. So where is Kalani from? What's your address? And it was like, "Well, buddy, um, looks like we're about to get real into it tonight because there's <laughs> no discussion about it. Like, if you can't say where your address or where your like, it's like one of them LA things where your where your grandma stay, where you like where your right, right, where your right, mom right, stay, right. like." It's like, oh, well, I'm not, like, you're not from here then. Uh-huh. And they'd be like, I think a lot of people claim the Bay because they'd be like, it's heavily influenced. Like, 
Like, I love New Orleans on the premise. Like, their music is similar. Bounce music remind me of hyphy music. Like, that's why it works. And people are like, oh, yeah, you love the Bay. I love New Orleans because y'all music is similar to the Bay Area. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. Those Master P, Cash Money started in Richmond. So it's like, people are like, what? Yeah, Cash Money Records is not a Southern thing. That's a real, actual Bay Area thing if you want to be legit about it. But it's like, mm-hmm. oh, people don't know that. Yeah, yeah, Master P is like I've talked about Master P on this podcast before, only just because of like how inspiring I find him. And um, his story and, and is I, like, bro, this, he's an entrepreneur. He did everything. Uh-huh. Like, uh huh. He should get a he should get man of the year for like you read his story. You like this is a brother who should write a book. Like you can play mm-hmm. in the NBA music exec. Like what? What have you not done at some point? It's like he could be teaching master classes because you did it. You've done a mm-hmm. lot, bro. <laughs> yeah, New Orleans is also a, a very. I have like I love going to New Orleans. It's like it's like my favorite city, you know. And I try like I been I went once in the pandemic, right when they started, right when they started to slowly open. Uh-huh. People were like, why the hell would you come down here, bro? Who I'm from California, so one thing once you get to a spot that's Cheaper food is cheap, good food, alcohol. I said, and they hospitable as hell in New Orleans. I, you can fall in love with a flight attendant on the flight because you'd be like, What can I get you, baby? Yo, Thursday night, you know, yeah, you free <laughs> Thursday. <to Friday. laughs> but like, I went to New Orleans and fell in love with the fact that they got brothers' chicken. Like all uh, that gas station got brothers sick. I was like, bro, this beating Popeyes. I'll never <laughs> was standing in the line at Popeyes. He's like, dude, that's really how you feel. I'm like, yeah. Well, Popeyes is from out there, and the Popeyes there. Well, they yeah. say it tastes different. I, I, I ain't, I ain't go to New Orleans and go to Popeyes, but they say the Popeyes <laughs> New Orleans is better than. It is. They, they really, they really do. They part down there like that. That's real. Like when I, I I made a point the first few times to really go to they pop, I was like, it can't be the same. It, and it really is. Like <laughs> the flavor is there. Well, you got you got you got a lot of beautiful stuff going on. You got a lot of um, you got a really great story. Um, I'm excited to do a fundraiser for you. Um, we're gonna put up your website so people um, can learn more about it and uh, know where to donate. We're coming into our rapid fire section. You ready? I'm ready. Do you meditate? Let me start my day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's a book you would recommend? Damn it. I, what is, oh, Collective Courage by Jessica Norm, uh, Norman Nimhart. Um, it's about collective econ- African American history on like cooperatives and like collective economics. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it really goes into the history of like how cooperatives came about. And you, it's really interesting because it talks about W.E.B. Du Bois a lot, which really made me wonder, like, is he like the black father of cooperatives, like cooperative economics and that thought? Because he's all through the book and he helped start several different cooperatives, even like from the South. And it, it really shows the history of how resilient black folks have been from like slavery on to currently and how collective economics has played a part in like reconstruction and like how black people really have been able to survive and really get in to these things and like building their own community with cooperatives and understanding like the business model of cooperatives is completely different on the premise of it's about the community it's about creating a solution to a problem and these people not benefiting for profit but for the sake of solving that problem how do you define success (laughs) i think people i think it's a personal thing because i I have had to look at this several times and be like, what, what, I've done so much. So realistically, I when I do the reflections, I'd be like, I could be proud of myself. If I wasn't to really accomplish anything else after this, I've done enough to say like, I've been oh, successful. Yeah, Even if it's not a monetary thing, I got a big house, I feel comforted in knowing like, no, I've done a lot. At the end of the day, I have a legacy. Someone can Google me, those types of things. So it's like, that's success to me. I think people get caught up in like, it's got to be money. I got to get the accolades. I got to get this. I'm like, nah, because right now I feel like our co-op has been a great success. In the six months that we've done and all that, we've been very successful. Even though we don't have a brick and mortar yet, it's coming. <laughs> and it just shows like, I feel that we've been successful on the premise. Like people know who we are. We've got fundraisers, those type of things. So, hey, 
I, right. I can't really ask for more at the current moment and I just hope that it continues on. What's your favorite food? Favorite food is chicken and broccoli Alfredo from Gypsies. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite drink? Oh, rosé, champagne, anything <laughs> like rosé all day. Uh, what personal weakness can you forgive in someone? That's a good one. Um, I, I'm, I'm really big on people like learning patience because I'll have people who have not necessarily been the most patient and it's like, bro, what, like, this is one of them traits where as you get older, you should learn how to be patient. Um, like my twin brother, for instance, was one of those people I did not used to deal with because his patience was very low. But as he started having kids, he's had to learn. So it's been like a little bit like one of the things like when we were younger, bro, I would not ask you for nothing because you're not you're not patient. It doesn't work. But now now that you've grown, you become a father, you've changed. So now it's like I've seen you grow, but it's really on the patience thing. You try to rush me and you're gonna patience, I'm mm-hmm. I'm busy. So it's like one of the mm-hmm. things like when I feel pressured, I'm gonna cut you off. Like you ain't got no patience. All right, well, damn it, fuck it. Like, this is my like <laughs> do you have a motto? So right now, it's kind of switched. It used to be like, if you're not helping nobody, put a smile on their face at the end of the day. What are you really living for? Uh, but now my new favorite one is um, buying groceries in your hood is a right, not a privilege. Um, everyone should have a right to buy their own food in their hood, regardless of social economic status. That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. Okay, last and final question. The house is on fire. All of the family members and pets are out. What are three things you grab? Backpack. <laughs> it's got all my work stuff in it. Um, I have a lockbox under my bed with all the personal stuff. And shit, I my phone's in my backpack once again. What's the last name? Uh, trying to grab probably some of my book collections because I got some priceless things and like a few of them got to come with me. Uh huh. This. Is cook on Monday morning the last and final discussions? This is my little cousin that's not so little. <laughs> uh, doing things that aren't so little. <laughs> big things for the community, big things. I feel for like you, cuzzo. <laughs> nah, we're gonna be like you. We're gonna support you, help you build, help you grow. Daniel Harris Lucas, I appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me, cuzzo. Peace, peace, and thank you for listening to another episode of Cook on Monday Morning. At Cook on Monday Morning, we are building lives that make us excited about Monday morning. We believe that if you can own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you can own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. Thank you again for listening. And thank you for subscribing. Please do so if you haven't already. I'm grateful for your support. Uh, Please share the podcast with a friend. Also help us grow this community of doers. Please take a minute to also Uh, rate and review the podcast on apple leave a comment on youtube it really helps people hear about and find what we're doing here if you're interested in starting your own podcast i wrote an article it's called how to start a podcast during the pandemic you can check the article in the description box if you want to uh you know see how i started this one the equipment we use some book recommendations that'd be helpful to consider check that out when you get a chance cook on monday morning is a product of the luther harris holding company we work in partnership to create solutions that drive impact. Uh, We build strategic partnerships between businesses and government. We recruit diversity talent into high impact roles, and we help companies drive impact in the places where they do business. If you'd like to learn more about that, feel free to email me, info at steveoncook.com. I'd like to thank the people that make our podcast possible, our videographer, David Topete. Thank you, David. Our copy editors, Fernando Seco Marquez and Devin Sketchinger. Thank you both also. I get up every morning with the intention to create value and showcase my love to the people that keep our cities moving. Uh, You are our teachers, garbage collectors, uh, school lunch workers, custodians, social workers, fire workers, police officers, EMT workers, bus drivers, and nurses. Uh, You are our employers, the people helping create jobs and keeping our economy growing. You are our gig workers, uh, stocking ourselves, driving our ride shares, delivering our food to all of you. This podcast is for you. You live in places like San Francisco, Oakland, 
Richmond, Antioch, San Mateo, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Miami, Orlando, the Carolinas, Virginia Beach, Milwaukee, Kansas City, Cleveland, Detroit, Harlem, Brooklyn. Uh, shout out to all of our listeners also know on the continent and around the world, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Jamaica, Kenya, and Ethiopia. To all of you, this podcast is for you. This message is touching the world and will continue to do so because of you. Until we meet again. Peace, peace, and we out.